Hi, I'm Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho. Many people have a general idea of what rangelands are, but today we're going to talk about the specific characteristics that make an ecosystem rangelands. Generally, people think of the, you know, the vast landscapes, the grasslands of the plains and the prairies, the, the sagebrush steppe, the Sonoran Desert, or maybe the canyon grasslands. But let's get into the specifics. What makes an ecosystem a rangeland? So which of these ecosystems are rangelands? Deserts, tundra, wetlands, savannas, shrublands, forests, grasslands, pastures, a diversity of ecosystems. Which are rangeland? All deserts are considered rangelands, except the really barren shifting sands where there's not a herba enough herbaceous vegetation to provide for grazing animals or for fire. All tundra is also rangelands, the high mountain tundra and also the high altitude tundra like up in Alaska. That would be managed by rangeland principles. All the green vegetation that's around streams, ponds, springs, lakes, etc., those are also considered rangelands and are managed with range management principles. Savannas are those places where there's an overstory of trees, where the, the canopy is well above the ground level, and at the ground level we have a lot of herbaceous plants like grasses and sometimes forbs. Those places are also rangeland, and they're important because fire maintains them along the ground surface and yet doesn't affect the trees so much. So fire is an important part of savannas, and again, they're rangelands. All shrublands are rangelands. Only the open part, open forests, the ones that don't have canopies that meet and provide enough sunlight and water to, pro, to create a, a, an understory of vegetation, or those open meadows between tree uh, stands, those would be considered uh, rangelands. But the dense forests are not range. All grasslands are a range, whether you call it prairies or steppes or grasslands, those are all rangeland. The one that is not are those highly managed pastures. Um, they are not considered rangelands. Um, rangelands differ from pasture, and people often don't understand this, but pastures are different because they are periodically cultivated and they're maintained by humans. The plants on pastures are generally introduced, improved forage plants, forage grasses, for example. They're usually irrigated, generally fertilized, and they're managed by agronomic rather than ecological principles. So although they look like rangelands and they are grazed by livestock, so there's some things they have in common, they also differ from rangelands. So what do rangelands have in common? Um, I think that the best way to think of them is just wild open spaces. They are, of course, those grasslands, shrublands, woodlands, deserts, savannas, tundra, steppe, and prairies that we've already talked about. But what they all have in common is that they have naturally growing plants, plants that survive on the amount of rain that falls on the land and the climatic conditions that are there. They're not irrigated and they're not fertilized. They're very diverse. Some rangelands are dry, some are moist, they're hot or cold, they're nearly barren or densely vegetated. The soils are also highly variable. Some of the least fertile soils on earth are on rangelands and some of the most fertile soils on earth are on rangelands. The one thing they all have in common is that there's no large trees and, that are a dominant on the ecosystem. So we have this sense of these vast open spaces where you can see for miles and miles. There's an old cowboy saying that rangelands are where there's more rivers and less water, more cows and less butter, and you can go further and see less than anywhere else in the world. Well, I'm not sure if you can see less, but these are lands where you can see for miles and miles. It's often easier to describe rangelands as what they are not than what they are. So rangelands are what we've talked about before. They are not barren desert, farmland, closed canopy forest, or lands that are covered by rocks, concrete, or glaciers. So they're kind of the leftover ecosystems. Um, if it weren't for some restrictions that prohibit farming on rangelands, most all of the grasslands, for example, the Palouse Prairie and the tall grass Prairie, um, would be converted to cropland. And in fact, today, there um, are only a, a very small amount of those fertile grasslands that remain as rangelands. There's several things that preclude either farming or timber production, and these include limited precipitation, sandy, saline, or wet soils, steep topography, and rocks. If it weren't for these characteristics, these lands probably would have been used for either lumber and timber 
or for cropland. Are all rangelands grazed? Well, actually, they may not all be grazed by livestock, but they are all grazed in some way. Grazing is a very important ecological principle on rangelands. Although they are not grazed by livestock, they are grazed by many animals, some sort of animal, wildlife, ungulates, deer, elk, pronghorn, but most important herbivores on rangelands are insects. They eat a lot out on the range, and sometimes we even have scourges of insects like grasshoppers or Mormon crickets that come across and really do show you how much um, of the vegetation is grazed by insects. So rangelands are a kind of land, not a specific use. So rangelands are not grazing lands. They are a type of land that is characterized by natural vegetation and large open spaces. They are not a land that is specifically grazed by livestock. So rangelands are important. They're half the earth, about half of the west, about half of Idaho, and states like Nevada have more than 80% of rangelands on them. They cover more of the earth's land surface than any other, any other vegetation type. They're about half of the earth land surface's range, about a quarter is forest, 10% is arable land. 3% of the earth's land surface is urban, although that is increasing, often taking over croplands or you know um, being developed into croplands ice rock bearing deserts, areas that probably will not be inhabited easily. Rangelands are diverse and beautiful landscapes across the globe. They include the African savanna, the sagebrush steppe of North America, the outback of Australia, and the Mongolian plains, and, and the tundra of the Arctic. All of those are these vast landscapes that are described as rangelands. North America also has some beautiful iconic rangelands, such as the plains grasslands, the tall grass prairie, short grass prairie, mixed prairie, the mountain grasslands, the oak savannas of California, and the Sonoran Desert are all rangeland ecosystems in North America. Of course, rangelands are important for things that they provide for ecosystem services and for humans, and those include, of course, livestock production that many people often think of when they think of rangelands but also water is very important, wildlife habitat, open spaces, recreation, forage, and the list grows every day that we expand our rangelands and start to use them more and more as humans. So think about it. If those are the beautiful vast landscapes with all these resources, what challenges or threatens rangelands today? What is it that we might need to think about as humans? What are some of the forces that threaten rangelands? Well, the ones that are most recognized are these, on sustainable grazing practices, we've come a long ways, but there still are areas that are definitely inappropriately grazed. There's damaging fire regimes, uh, there's invasive plants, weeds are becoming a, a growing problem on rangelands. Climate variability and climate change are threatening ecosystems and interacting with fire. And of course, human development or expansion, urbanization, and uses of these rangelands also can cause threats. Throughout this class, we're going to learn more about how we, as land managers and citizens that use rangelands, can affect these um, forces that affect rangeland integrity.